Hello friends, I hope you are well. Techman Pat here and today we're checking out this. The behemoth of a monitor, the 57 inch Odyssey Neo G9. Curved QLED DUHD gaming monitor from Samsung. And since its announcement in January, I was excited, pumped and absolutely hyped, no doubt about it. It's big, it's beautiful, and the specs are all about gaming. Something that I don't get to do as much anymore. So it was absolutely perfect. Now I jest, gaming is a lifelong addiction, ain't no way to stop that train. So speaking of trains, does this monitor live up to the hype train? What's it like for work, gaming, and media consumption? And what about the specs? Do they live up to the marketing hype? So I'm gonna come right out. It has been years since I've laughed in disbelief out of of sheer amazement at the sight. The first thing I tried was Doom Eternal in HDR. I felt like a kid at Christmas, the size, the color, the pure enjoyment from sitting in front of this G9. I have not had such a feeling when testing a new piece of technology in years. So in today's video, I'll try to go beyond the marketing, hopefully presenting the reality that is the Odyssey G9. With that in mind, my first complaint is the naming scheme. It's horrible. But what's not horrible is a segue today's sponsor, my wife, specifically for not checking the bank statements after seeing the fridge sized box that arrived at our door. So make sure to smash the like button and subscribe to support this channel. Let's get started by rolling the intro. Let's talk specs. The screen size is 57 inches with a matte anti-glare finish. The resolution is that of two 32 inch screens. And no, it's not 8K like the media articles tout that would be four 4K screens. It's only 7,680 by 2,160. The aspect ratio is the annoyingly unsupported 32 by nine by many games, even though it's 2023 with a 1000R curve, giving your entire periphery a beautiful screen to look at, which is the same as the classic G9, my old monitor, but now way bigger. And for those who like vertical real estate, you get much more in this version. So if that was stopping you from buying this monitor, then watch out, it's got a lot of it. It has an amazing contrast ratio of 2500 to one, a one millisecond gray to gray response, HDR 1000 VESA certified, which, you know, doesn't mean much, but it allows for HDR10 gaming with a 95% DCI color gamut coverage and a max refresh rate of 240 Hertz. Preemptively, before I dwell deeper into HDR gaming, I can say, finally, a monitor that does the HDR well. It's been a road of broken promises until this G9 right here. The mini LED quantum dot technology with 2,392 dimming zones on a VA panel, well, when you sit in front of it, you will be shocked to know it's not OLED. My God, are the blacks inky. They're so inky black, it's beautiful. And with a chance of burning on an OLED, there is no way I can recommend an OLED panel for a computer monitor after looking at this. Mini LED is incredible. Now there's no G-Sync, instead we have FreeSync Premium Pro, which isn't a problem for Nvidia users, so don't freak out. The FreeSync is now up to par with G-Sync's Premium. Let me tell you this, Nvidia's reign is over in that department. In regards to connectivity, we have a USB 3.0 hub with two USB ports. Three HDMI ports, version 2.1, that's gonna be important later on in the video. Disappointingly, only one display port, version 2.1. I'm pretty bummed on this one. I was hoping for at least, I don't know, two. So you can plug in two things that are DP port. Now for some features that not everyone will use, a KVM switch is included, allowing for one set of keyboard and mice to control more than two computers. There is picture in picture, a vase amount, and the biggest draw card is the picture in picture, of course, where you can hook up, let's say an Apple TV, another computer, a PS5, Xbox, and so on, and basically have two 32 inch screens side by side. In the box, you have a power cable, an HDMI cable, a display port cable, and they're all rather short. The stand, a VESA adapter, and the total weight with the stand is 19 kilograms, and without it, it's 15 kilograms. Yep, my Ergotron HX arm can handle it, but the heavy duty pivot that I had to buy extra on top of my Ergotron arm does not due to the front heavy distribution of the weight in the G9. Ergotron has told me they are working on a new pivot, but the process can take nearly a year. So if you can't wait, you can throw a couple of screws in there to jam the spring from drooping. Now this monitor is pretty large and I think the way to have and use this monitor is with an arm. The problem is there's really no arm right now to handle this. So I guess you're gonna be stuck 
with the actual stand, which takes up a lot of space on your desk. Okay, folks, let's talk elephants that may or may not be in the room with us. The screen needs a powerful graphics card to drive the resolution and get anywhere close to 240Hz refresh rate in gaming. Technically, it's two 4K screens and still, I remember when a few years ago we were talking about gaming at 4K at 60 frames. Well, we've just crossed that line and probably left that line a long time ago. First of all, what makes gaming at two times 4K possible? Well, it's DLSS and FSR. Without it, modern AAA games would not be hitting anywhere near 60 frames, let alone 240 that this monitor is capable of. Now on the market right now, the most powerful card is the RTX 4090. But here's the fun part, the display port on the most expensive Nvidia card is version 1.4, which supports 1440p resolution at up to 240Hz, not this, 4K at up to 120Hz, close, 5K resolutions at up to 60Hz, and 8K resolutions at 30Hz. So you can see where I'm going with this. The port is unable to drive this monitor. At the moment, the display port in an RTX 4090 can reach 120 hertz at the native resolution with 10-bit color. This is a physical limitation and there is nothing you, as the user, can do about it. However, there is hope. The RTX 4090 comes with a HDMI 2.1a standard which can support the full native resolution at 240 hertz and 10-bit color on paper. But as of right now, it is still stuck at 120 hertz. However, for some reason, the NVIDIA panel does let me select 12-bit color, which makes no sense at all since the panel is only 10-bit. The hope I speak of is that there is a potential that a firmware update for the G9 and an NVIDIA software update will support the full specifications via DSC, which is an image compression process. But until then, there is only one option, AMD. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. The RTX 7900 XT supports the display DisplayPort 2.1 and it manages to hit native resolution at 240Hz. However, the card's performance is not up to par with the RTX 4090. On average, the 4090 performs 56% better than the RX 7900 XT at 4K. But it's not all doom and gloom, however. The good thing is, in a roundabout way, neither card is going to be kicking up 240Hz in a AAA game. And 120Hz seems to be the sweet spot right now, even for shooters like Doom, CSGO, and Call of Duty. Your competitive shooters don't generally support 32 by 9 anyway, so I doubt competitive gamers will be buying this monitor. With all the boring bits out of the way, and I hope I haven't lost you yet, let's talk about real world usage. And let me provide some context. With a water-cooled RTX 4090, my experience was the top end. If you are not willing to shell out for a high-end graphics card, this monitor might not be for you. So let's talk gaming. The G9 feels like the pinnacle of technological excess. A 57 inch screen that wraps around your periphery, a crisp resolution with a 140 PPI. I cannot see any pixels like I could with the 49 inch version. The dual 4K screen resolution is a thing of beauty. It makes for a fantastic desktop experience. But the games, oh the games, they look incredible. Baldur's Gate 3, a rich and colorful, detailed fantasy world is mind-blowing on this monitor. The Dungeons & Dragons world around you with its 32 by 9 aspect ratio support, it's another experience on another level. And after some modifications, due to Bethesda's laziness, I got Starfield to fill the screen and run DLSS. And while in my opinion the game doesn't live up to the hype, it looks great and runs at about 90 to 120 frames, depending on the environment. And as far as talking simulators go, it's a nice experience. But I wasn't sure how this monitor would cope with first person shooters. It's big, the high resolution could cause lower frame rates, and shooters need those frame rates. But when I played Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, I was again blown away at how responsive the screen was, and with DLSS at balanced, I was getting around 120 frames on average. It was glorious. And of course CSGO with the same smooth gunplay with no scan lines, no broken frames. It was incredibly smooth. Performance wise, I found the RTX 4090 struggled to be fully utilized in games on my old monitor. My frames have increased due to the resolution being higher now. Letting the card go full bore 
has actually been a positive thing. The card was held back at 1440p. Not anymore. Car and flight sim enthusiasts, rejoice. This one is for you. One monitor the size of front and cockpit windscreen? Well, how can you say no? There's just no compromise with this screen on sim games. Now, do you want to take all these games to the next level, obviously aside from Starfield at the moment? Well, just turn on HDR. All I have to say, Finally, a monitor that reproduces HDR like no other, except obviously an OLED. Now, Doom Eternal and Shadow of the Tomb Raider is my go-to HDR test kit, and both games look stunning. The 57 inches of real estate and the resolution are complementary to the HDR performance. It's great. The colors are incredible and the brightness is out of this world. In fact, I have to turn down the brightness. It's at 23 out of 100 due to how blinding it can get. Now, Doom was a highlight. It was my wow moment. HDR, fast response rate, high refresh rates with DLSS, this shoot 'em up looks like a dream and plays like an esports title. I had so much fun. I played Doom into the night only to really not want to go to sleep, but man, get some sleep, folks. Please note, turn off the adaptive picture and eye saver mode and eye care on the monitor, otherwise display port HDR will not work properly. So let me reiterate, this is the best HDR monitor I have used so far. The mini LED dimming zones and quantum dock technology do a fantastic job at keeping the blacks inky dark. So unless you're staring at the screen from an odd angle or from above, you cannot see any blooming or halo effects on white content unless you just religiously pixel peep. However, it's not OLED. If there is a white spot and it's a small enough one, let's say a mouse pointer against a large black background, the white dot will look very gray. It's very noticeable. The area just doesn't light up enough to give you a clear white color, especially for mouse pointers. I have lost my mouse in a black area a few times already, and you can really see it when you move your mouse from a black area into or closer to the white or the lit up colors. The mouse just suddenly gets wider and more pronounced. It's very obvious. There's no fix for this. This is the reality of dimming zones and the lack there of a large number of them as some would see it as a deal breaker and I don't but do let me know in the comments what you guys think of it. Will this stop you from buying this monitor? Mm, I don't think so. Connecting the PS5 to the monitor in picture in picture mode is cool. I prefer my mini LED TV but it's nice to know you can have an all-in-one experience in front of your desk. I think it would work great for people who stream console games and for those who like to, I don't know, play a video game and watch a movie or TV show on the side. And if you wanna run the PS5 or any other content at a normal aspect ratio in native mode, you can go into the screen settings and change the ratios, leaving black bars on the sides. It's native built into the screen. Now, in regards to general computer use, this is when the G9 beats out any OLED counterpart. For spreadsheets and Word, this monitor excels. See what I did there? Forgive me. It's great for web browsing, YouTube, and any other content consumption you can think of. Windows 11 HDR is still bad, so don't use that, but overall text is crisp. There's plenty of room on the screen for multiple windows. So using this for work is an absolute pleasure and of course watching TV shows, movies and anything else on this is great. In saying that, for the creative types, this isn't a monitor for color correction. It's good but not perfect. I think it's a small price to pay and not a big difference but it will be for professionals who get paid for their work. Now for Mac users, you're out of luck if you don't own an M2 Apple device. With the way things are, there is no way to get native resolutions without having M2 and the max frame rate is only 120 hertz, which is fine as you aren't really gaming on a Mac anyway. My M1 gets 1440p resolutions via the USB-C to display port adapter and it's good enough to work on it day to day. Text is clear, though maybe it feels a little bit large. Now I'm currently sitting 800 millimeters away from the center of the screen. The edges are further away at 880 millimeters and I don't see the bending that people talk about in curves and I do prefer this curve to the 1800R of the OLED G9. At this size it is much more immersive and easier on the eyes than anything less than a thousand R. Even in broad daylight the screen is clear and bright and the matte film does a great job at reducing glare. So even at these odd angles, you're not gonna see any shiny glaring when you sit in front of it. The protective film for shipping left a whole bunch of white gunk in the panel seam. It took me ages to clean it out, and there are still bits there, and that is actually pretty disappointing. 
come on Samsung. Now settings wise, and this may vary for you, but I've set local dimming to high, enhanced contrast to high, adaptive sync is on, black equalizer is at five, picture mode at original, save energy off, best brightness is off, and in Windows, I'm using 125% scaling. It's crisp and it feels fresh. You can also turn on adjust brightness based on your environment, but I do prefer the constant look. I couldn't get the core sync to turn on, meaning the background light doesn't match what's on screen, but again, not the biggest issue, maybe in a few updates, and you really can't see the RGB behind a screen unless you have a wall really close. Now, I'll update the pinned comment on this video if there are any updates or firmware that come out for this monitor that change things. Now, coming from the original 49-inch G9, this monitor works very well out of the box. I had a lot of issues that took months to fix on the old one, but not in this G9. But many commentators have highlighted the lack there of QA from Samsung. It could be a loud minority, but keep that in mind if you end up having issues. It's time to talk price. Now I'm sitting in a weird camp, and no, it's not band camp. I got the pre-order bonus of 300 bikis off the RRP of 3,199. So at 2,851, the G9 57 inch is the same price as my original G9 from three years ago. So at 3,149, it is roughly the same price, again, if you take inflation into account. Count. So the price, I think, hasn't really strayed away from its roots. That's not to say it's not expensive. There isn't any new technology in this monitor. Coming back to the beginning of this video, this is excess of everything built so far. It's the inflection point of technology. It's the size, the resolution, the HDR performance, the mini LED, and the high refresh rate but it's nothing new per se. Samsung has put all that is good into a slick package that performs incredibly well, and for a price that I would say is justified based on the lack of competition in this size, maybe not the lack of competition on other similar monitors in other aspect ratios. So does it do everything that is advertised? Well, yes, if you have shelled out thousands of dollars for equipment to run it, and of course you also have the newest generation of said equipment, and that's not for everyone. One. So will it sell well? Yes. So should you buy it? Well, if you have the horsepower and already love ultra-wide monitors, there is nothing like the 57-inch G9. For productivity, this is a clear choice over the OLED in both size and clear text. While OLED provides amazing contrast, this G9 gets you there about 80 to 90%. Obviously, there's the inclusion of the larger size. So lastly, if you love immersive gaming, then this one is for you. The Samsung 57-inch Odyssey G9 is a beast. So friends, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has helped you to make a decision on this monitor. Either way, make sure you like this video. If you did, share it around too, because that really, really helps and I'll highly appreciate it. But most of all, tap the subscribe button. That makes all the difference. Maybe Samsung will let me review other monitors in their lineup because those aren't cheap either. Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you all in another one. Bye.